Welcome to the Just Ingredients Podcast. I'm Cara Lynn, and here we talk all things nourishing to the mind, body, and soul. This is a place where you can find just good ingredients to life. This podcast is sponsored by Llama Naturals. I learned about Llama Naturals a few months ago, and I honestly wish someone had told me about them sooner. I always recommend that people get their vitamins from whole food sources, not synthetics. But I could never find a good option for my kids until I found Llama Naturals. They have a full line of delicious gummies that are made with real fruit, no added sugar or sweeteners, plus vitamins from whole foods. They are USDA organic, vegan, gluten-free, and allergen-free. Plus, they are seriously delicious. You can save 20% off your first order by going to llamanaturals.com and using the coupon code JUST, J-U-S-T. My whole family loves them, but if you have a picky eater, they offer a money-back guarantee. Seriously, you should at least go to their site and compare their label against any other gummy brand out there. They are the best I've found. Again, it's llamanaturals.com. Tyler Jean is passionate about educating others on the importance of food as medicine while inspiring them to embrace healthier lifestyles. Currently, he is in his last year of med- medical school. Tyler will soon be a licensed naturopathic doctor and will use his practice to take a more integrative and preventative approach to health care. This is also the approach he currently uses through his platform at Functional Foods on Instagram. There, he empowers his audience with educational info, brand recommendations, recipes, inspiration, and more. I am so excited to have you, Tyler. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Caroline. I've been looking forward to this. Well, I just love following your Instagram. I learned so much from it. Um, so everybody, if you don't if you don't know who Tyler Jean is, go follow him on Functional Foods. It's such a great um, Instagram account. But tell my followers a little bit about yourself and maybe why you got into naturopath um, school, why you're going into medicine, things like this. Yeah, and I'll have to say, I'm such a fan of your account too, Caroline. I actually just uh, shared uh, one of the... Uh, resources that you provided. And I love the way that you make things tangible for people that I think we can often overlook in healthcare. So uh, just a, a extension of gratitude to what you're doing. As oh, well. well, thank you. Thank you. Um, I got into medicine because I had my own health issues. And so um, when I was growing up, I dealt with some mental health issues, both uh, diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder and ADHD. Um, and also suffered, suffered from asthma and eczema, which commonly run together. Um, and I thank my dad for that as well. There's definitely a a genetic component to that, but, you know, I really wanted to understand why I was dealing with these things and wanting to get to the root cause as to why I was struggling with these things. Because when I was younger and I was going through high school and college, really the only option that was presented to me was pharmaceutical medications. And I didn't want to just, um, you know, succumb to taking pharmaceuticals for the rest of my life. So it really propelled me on this journey to really understand the body and the intricacies and the root cause, you know, approaches to, you know, healing from some of these chronic conditions that, you know, over, you know, half the population deals with some type of chronic illness this day and age. So, um, you know, I also had this fascination of the human body in general. I was a student athlete. I swam at the University of California, Santa Barbara at a pretty elite level. And that was kind of where my um, passion for nutrition ignited because I was looking at how I could fuel myself on a daily basis and achieve athletic superiority through nutrition in addition to, you know, all the training I was doing. So really those were kind of like the, the early aspects of my journey and kind of fueling me to where I am today. And as far as getting into naturopathic medicine in particular, which is its own, you know, unique branch of medicine that is different from your allopathic medical uh, career path where someone may attend, you know, medical school, either to be an MD or um, a doctor of osteopathic, a DO, naturopathic Naturopathic doctors or NDs, you may also see it uh, credentialed as naturopathic medical doctors or NMDs. It's a four-year medical school um, that is separate from, again, MDs and DOs, but it really looks at the underlying root cause, it looks at the person as a whole, and really this preventative approach to medicine so that people can really take this proactive approach to their health. And I really think that the focus is more on how to cultivate health as opposed to focusing on kind of like sick care and how to treat disease and the manifestations of disease when we think of pathophysiology. 
I love that you took like a struggle in your life and have now turned it into a positive of going to medical school and wanting to help others with that. That is so awesome. Um, so I know you said you struggled with anxiety and that's what I would love to talk to you about today because I have so many followers who do struggle with anxiety. So, um, what was your experience with it was like you said, you did start with the pharmaceutical route, I'm assuming, but then did you treat it with food? Are you still working on it? What's your experience with it? Yeah, I'm happy to share. I'm pretty, you know, transparent with my community, with my own struggles, and I use it as teaching points um, because, you know, I think it's important to, um, you know, remember that we're all human and that we're all kind of going through our own battles and struggles and working through things. And um, yes, I mean, when I was struggling with anxiety, I kind of waited to get help because I really didn't even know um, that this was something that was more serious. And it wasn't until um, I first started college that I actually started to seek uh, pharmaceutical management for my anxiety. Uh, but I was uh, diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder in seventh grade. So this was in middle school. Um, and it was pretty crippling for me, to be honest. And the way that anxiety showed up for me was chest tightness. Um, I'm, you know, lucky in the way that I never really truly experienced a panic attack. I've been on the verge of a couple of panic, panic attacks, but it's never gone full blown. But, you know, you know, anxiety disorders and anxiety in general and the umbrella of different forms of anxiety are the most common psychiatric disorder in the U.S. So, so many people deal with it. So it is so, so, so common. And there can be a number of reasons why someone struggles with anxiety. So for me personally, kind of getting into naturopathic medicine, I wanted to understand the root cause. What were the physical manifestations of anxiety? What is that root cause? Where were the imbalances? Could I treat it with food? What about supplements? What about with herbs? I feel like I've gone through the gauntlet. And you know, with each different intervention that I employed, I learned little, little bits about how I responded to those things and understanding where my anxiety was coming from. Because when you think about root causes, the root cause for each person can be a little bit different. So right. you know, for some people, it can be micronutrient deficiencies. For another person, it can be chronic inflammation. For another person, it can be blood sugar issues. For another person, it can be environmental toxicants. For another person, it can be trauma related. So there's all these different intricacies. Mm -hmm. For me personally, and the reason why I did not respond well to medication, and for me, um, I took Ativan, which is also known as lorazepam, and I was also prescribed Xanax. Um, I did not like the way those made me feel. It really made me feel numbed out. Um, and I also uh, often felt really tired uh, when I took those medications. And I was also still trying to swim and be a student athlete while taking those medications. And so, you know, I did find a lot of healing in food. That's kind of why my platform is all about food as medicine, because I truly believe it. But just because maybe someone's root cause is food and, and they find significant relief may not mean that that is the root cause for someone else. So, you know, some things early on that I noticed after trying pharmacological therapy um, and realizing like that wasn't for me was trying an elimination diet. I went gluten-free and that actually significantly helped. And, you know, there's not significant literature to connect that gluten is a, a true root cause. And if you look at you know, otherwise healthy individuals and those with celiac disease who truly have this autoimmune component to where they can't properly or they react to the gluten protein found in wheat or barley or rye, um, there is no clear association. Meaning that just because, you know, you consume gluten and you do feel better, you don't, doesn't mean like that's going to be the same for everyone. So right. um, really it was kind of a, a broad, uh, kind of like a broad scope, kind of like what I did. It was kind of this elimination of a lot of the refined processed packaged foods that I was consuming on a daily basis and really focusing on more whole foods, more nutrient density and more colors. But I did notice that there was an inflammatory component to gluten. And that was kind of like that first kind of like, you know, spark that maybe really start to dive down the rabbit hole of nutrition and how that could be uh, beneficial. So um, I will say, I, we can go into like all, all the different things that I did in terms of, you know, naturopathic interventions. But for me, my anxiety at large is trauma related. It was not physical related. And I think that's also important to recognize in a naturopathic medicine, we recognize that the body as a whole is not disconnected from the mind, you know, mind, right. body, spirit, emotional, for sure. all connected. So those are some things that I had to really work through. And some of the things that have given me immense relief are neurofeedback, which um, I'm currently working through and I'm almost done with, but even stuff like hypnotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, plant medicine, meditation, breath work, all these things have really been instrumental in kind of this, you know, 
a total approach to anxiety that I would say, you know, I'm probably 70% over the hump of kind of where I was 10 years ago. So I'm still a work in progress and still learning all these things. I know this is kind of like a long winded answer, but um, you know, I'm still working on it, but I have found the most healing with using more of the tools that are related to the emotional body over kind of the physical things. Okay. I love that you shared all of that. I love that you're saying you're still on a journey because I tell people a health journey can be a lifetime of always trying to make better choices and feeling better, things like that. But let's take a step back because I do want to talk to you about some of those alternative therapies that you've done. I want to talk to you more specifically about food, but let's take even a step back and let's explain what anxiety is because I think that word gets used loosely. Like people will just say, oh my gosh, I'm so, um, I have so much anxiety when sometimes I think maybe they are just stressed about something that's coming up in their life or something. So what is anxiety um, like in the medical field, what do you consider anxiety? Yeah, that's a really great question. And sometimes it's important to, to distinguish stress versus anxiety. So with anxiety from like a medical perspective, typically we're looking at a structure in the brain called the amygdala. And the amygdala um, is kind of what initiates that, that fear-based response. And so we see in individuals with anxiety that um, they have this excessive amygdala activation and that this influences various neurotransmitters, which are chemical messengers that are, can be manufactured in the gut, but they're also seen in the brain. And a lot of your pharmaceuticals can modulate those neurotransmitters, but the amygdala is influenced by all these different aspects, whether that is the HPA axis, which is response to stress, um, or again, these neurotransmitters or even the gut microbiome. So really we're looking at these main neurotransmitters such as norepinephrine, serotonin, and glutamate. And for those that don't know what those neurotransmitters are, the really brief skinny, glutamate is our main excitatory neurotransmitter. Serotonin is often thought of as our happy and motivation neurotransmitter and norepinephrine is kind of that fight or flight, get up and go, um, hormone, um, and neurotransmitter. And we typically see the people with anxiety have higher levels of these neurotransmitters. And so, you know, really when you're thinking about anxiety and kind of a treatment approach from an allopathic perspective, it's how we can either reduce um, the, uh, amount of ex excitation in the body or reducing the amount of sympathetic arousal, that fight or flight, or reducing that HPA axis function and decreasing the amygdala activity. That is in a nutshell, what anxiety is. And okay. some of those symptoms that people may experience in terms of anxiety that people are familiar with are stuff like restlessness. They feel worried all the time. There's fear. They may have panic. They may have sleep disturbances. They're irritable. They have muscle tension decreased concentration. And some people may be like, I have all these things. Yeah. I was going to say some right? people might say that. <laughs> so, you know, to diagnose anxiety, it's, you know, they're using the uh, DSM five criteria um, for mental health. And, um, you know, they're looking at these symptoms and they're looking at how does it impair your activities of daily, daily living over a six month period. So it has to be something that affects you every day or very frequently over a six month period and mm -hmm. affects your quality of life. And then they're looking at those different symptoms. And then they, from there, will recommend a number of different approaches, depending on what that patient is open to. Okay. That time frame makes sense because um, I think a lot of people think, well, I feel that when a test is coming or when a project is due at work or when, you know, an interview is coming or something, but that's different because that's normal to feel that, you know, when a big event or something stressful is happening, but it's the constant every day for over a long period of time, like you said. So thank you yeah. for explaining that. That makes sense. Okay. And so I will just, oh, go just ahead. one thing I'll add is like, yes, anxiety is a part of life and it shows up at different times, whether that's relationships around money, around, you know, parenting or safety. So, you know, anxiety is common um, and it's looking at more like how is it affecting the quality of life and the chronicity of it as well. Gotcha. That makes sense. Okay. So let's talk about food and we touched upon it a little bit, but how does food play a part in anxiety? Can it help? And does it tend to make anxiety worse? So it's a great question. It's a, a yes and no, and it really depends on the person. I do believe that, you know, food does play a profound role, but for everyone, it's not the silver bullet answer. And I think we would like it to be, I wish it was that simple. Um, I found a lot of healing through food, but for some people they've done all of the, the things that I'm going to talk about right now in terms of food and they still deal with anxiety. So it's important to work up what are organic causes that could be contributing to anxiety as well, or maybe there's just another piece of the puzzle that needs to be figured out. So 
Um, yes, there's a, there's a strong connection between food and you know how it specifically impacts the gut microbiome and the connection to anxiety disorders and gut issues. So that's something I kind of wanted to focus on a little bit too. And when it comes to food, um, you're probably familiar of stuff like prebiotics and probiotics. So prebiotics are the non-digestible carbohydrates such as fiber that we can't break down, but the resident bacteria in our gut can. And these prebiotics can influence the production of various communities within our gut, mainly lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. And these can influence the production of neurotransmitters. So if we're thinking about neurotransmitters and how it influences the amygdala, that over excitation and fear and worry, that's that whole connection there. And then you have, and those are gonna be found in things such as all your fibrous foods, which are found in plants. So Jerusalem artichoke, you can think of bananas, you can think of apples, you can think of jicama, asparagus, onions, garlic, leeks, all those things are great and uh, various fruits as well. Then you have probiotics and fermented foods. I'm a big fan of fermented foods. That can be stuff like kimchi, sauerkraut. Uh, it can be stuff like kefir and yogurt that are truly cultured and fermented um, and stuff like miso. But then you also have probiotics that are marketed that can be taken in supplemental form. Um, and you know we can get into that too if you want, but those are kind of the different areas of food and how those are gonna impact and modulate the gut microbiome and influence you know, your mood as well as your, your mental state because of the gut brain connection. And we can go on that more too, if you want. So those are kind of two pillars that I kind of start with because of the gut brain connection. And right. in terms of food that are going to make anxiety worse, really, it's kind of looking at your standard American diet. And so this is kind of a high, highly refined, high carbohydrate diet, really high. And a lot of your refined vegetable oils and industrialized vegetable oils that are more inflammatory, uh, which I know you talk about on your page. And these are the, the canolas, the safflower, the sunflower, the uh, grapeseed oils, and the soybean oils and the cottonseed oils that um, you know, are also used to fry food. So you're thinking about fried food, high fat, high carbohydrate, low nutrient density, low fiber. And we're talking about the role of fiber and how it influences the gut. So that's another big issue there as well. It's also typically really high in saturated fat. And, you know, depending on the quantity, the quality of the saturated fat and, you know, the, the community and the environment of the gut, it can also um, contribute to inflammation in a way. So there's some nuances in that. So standard American diet is a big problem and that's what most people consume. Um, I would also say that caffeine is one of those things that can, can make things worse. And, you know, most people are aware of that too. If they have too much caffeine that they feel more anxious and jittery and restless. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's typically best to keep caffeine consumption under hundred milligrams. If you're someone on the anxious spectrum, um, artificial sweeteners also going to directly impact the gut microbiome Ar aspartame being one of those in particular. And so, you know, I know a lot of people in the, um, toxicology space or people that want to point out that, oh, this food is safe and it's the dose that makes the poison, even if it may not at a certain dose lead to, um, toxic like effects and, and physical manifestations from consuming it. Do we actually know what alterations are happening to the gut microbiome, regardless of how much we're consuming? And we don't have that information yet, but I definitely take this more precautionary approach where in animal studies, which are more on the lower totem pole of hierarchy of evidence, that there is evidence to suggest that we should be cautious. And so I'm one of those people that abstains from sugar, alcohols, and artificial sweeteners for that reason, and try to just get back to things that are just as, you know, um, natural as possible. So um, that's another big one. And then alcohol, alcohol is another big one too. Um, it also um, not only increases inflammation in the body, but it can also deplete various micronutrients such as magnesium and vitamin B1, which are um, crucial in kind of uh, the manufacturing and the breakdown of neurotransmitters in the brain. Wow. I love that you shared all of that. And I know followers will be like, oh my gosh, that sounds so overwhelming, but I want to tell them it really isn't like fiber is huge and only 5% of Americans actually get enough fiber. And so if you're listening and it sounds overwhelming, just add some more fruits and vegetables every day to your diet. It's as simple as that. And like getting rid of just taking some things out of your diet, like getting rid of some of the inflammatory oils or some of the artificial sweeteners. So it doesn't have to be overwhelming you guys, but that's great advice. I love that. And I want to state with the artificial sweeteners, I have read some animal studies where it does destroy the, um, the bacteria in the gut and it can destroy it within minutes. And then it takes months to repair or to rebuild that bacteria. So I'm glad you right. stated that. That's yeah. a huge connection, the gut brain connection. 
Yep. And those bacteria are responsible in a way for producing those neurotransmitters such as serotonin and dopamine. So, you know, there's an intimate role between the guts and the bacteria that are um, resident in the, in the, in the colon and how it's communicating with the brain via the enteric nervous system and the vagus nerve. So there are these fibers that are basically going from the gut to the brain and there's more crosstalk and, you know, um, more talk going from the gut to the brain than there is from the brain to the gut. So, you know, we're just learning more and more and more. So, you know, just staying open-minded and thinking about how food um, can be impacting this and irrespective of weight, which I know a lot of people when thinking about food, they think about nutrient density, which is great, but they're also thinking about, is this going to cause weight gain or weight loss? Right. Um, and food, you know, provides so much more information than that. Yes, it does. So many vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, phytonutrients, you name it. Yeah. Okay. So you talked about the gut with the food. Does inflammation play a part in anxiety as well? It absolutely does. And so we're learning more and more about the role of neuroinflammation. And, um, you know, when the gut is inflamed, and you can see this in people with like irritable bowel disease or inflammatory bowel disease, sorry, Crohn's and colitis, which are autoimmune disease where there is, um, you know, inflammation in the gut. And these people and these individuals are more likely to um, deal with mental health issues, whether that is anxiety or depression and anxiety and depression, I will say like to run together. So mm -hmm. up to two thirds of those with anxiety also have depression as well. And so the role of neuroinflammation is really interesting and kind of this brain on fire or, you know, uh, inflamed gut, inflamed brain. And that also has to do with, again, the bacteria that is in the gut and the type of bacteria that is in the gut is influenced by the food we eat and the bacteria give off various different byproducts. And those byproducts um, basically are information in a way that um, sends signals to the brain um, and in the presence of the inflammatory load in general, certain neurotransmitters are, um, they, they're shunted in terms of how they're made. So I wanna just give an example, serotonin being one of those that a lot of people are familiar with. And, you know, a lot of these neurotransmitters that people that are kind of like the targeted approach when we're using pharmaceuticals, um, those neurotransmitters are made from the food we eat. They're made up of amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein. And they're also made from a lot of those micronutrients, so vitamins and minerals. So again, the need for nutrient uh, density and nutrient sufficiency in the diet. So in particular, tryptophan, which is an amino acid, is the precursor to 5-HTP, which is converted into serotonin. It uses stuff like iron and B vitamins to convert to serotonin. However, in the presence of inflammation, instead of that tryptophan being converted to 5-HTP and serotonin, it actually gets shunted down a different pathway and the production of um, uh, various metabolites that ultimately create this compound called quinolate. Quinolate can increase excites, um, excitic toxicity in the body. It also reduces the amount of what is called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's basically miracle growth for the brain, helps for the brain to grow new synapses and neurons and helps to really um, you know, strengthen those connections. And so these are things that we do want. We want more BNF. We don't want so much excitation because more excitation is going to lead to more anxiety, symptoms of, um, you know, schizophrenia, bipolar, OCD, like all those things are connected to more excitation, more glutamate. So, you know, inflammation can drive different pathways in a way and, you know, alter the concentrations of the neurotransmitters that are being made in the gut that are ultimately communicating with the brain as well. So, so interesting. there is a role with inflammation. So inflammation basically can mess up the communication is what you're saying. It can. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So my listeners, I'm sure like, well, what do I do? What do I do to reduce this inflammation? So what would you suggest? Yeah. I mean, this is, I'm a big proponent of an anti-inflammatory diet. So it's removing the uh, most common antigenic, which are allergenic foods, as well as the common inflammatory foods. And, you know, I'm a big proponent of an elimination diet. That was kind of where I first started personally. Um, but it's not a, a long-term solution. In a way, it's a way to be more in tune with how your body is responding to the foods that you eat and trying to figure out what are your triggers? What's unique for me? Because we're all biochemically unique and individual. So, you know, what works for me may not work for you or, and vice versa. So, um, you know, anti-inflammatory diets kind of figure out what are some of those foods and some of the more common foods that can contribute to inflammation. And, so, and especially in those that um, are more susceptible are things like soy, gluten, corn, dairy, refined sugars, um, 
let's see, alcohol, citrus for some people, chocolate for some people, unfortunately. Um, but again, each person is going to tolerate that a little bit differently. And, you know, quality definitely matters, but it could be as simple as taking four to six weeks to kind of, you know, minimize these foods in the diet or eliminate them, keep a, a diet journal, kind of figure out how do I feel about this? Do I notice improvements? Do I feel worse? And then systematically reintroducing them one by one to see, um, do those symptoms come back? Do I feel better? Do I feel worse? So that can be a tool that people can definitely use. But I also really love, um, you even mentioned too, incorporations of fruits and vegetables. And those fruits and vegetables contain those prebiotics that we talked about. They also contain antioxidants, uh, such as vitamin C and vitamin E. Um, and those can also help to modulate inflammation. And so those are really great as well to get in the diet. And they're also gonna influence uh, the communities of bacteria that reside in the gut that, and some of those bacteria can actually be contributing to inflammation and other ones can be anti-inflammatory. So again, how food is contributing and influence the gut microbiome. The last thing I will say too, and you know, a big pillar um, to I think um, the anti-inflammatory benefits in particular and anti-anxiolytic benefits or the anxiolytic benefits is omega-3s. And there's actually really good research to show the benefits of omega-3s for anxiety as well as depression. So we have meta-analysis, which is the highest on the poll of looking at the hierarchy of evidence where they basically take all these different randomized control trials and they pool all those random, randomized control trials together. And they say, what is the overall you know, quality of evidence based on all of these trials? What is it ultimately saying? And we're seeing that there is an, uh, that omega-3s uh, show a reduction in anxiety symptoms. And it's the EPA the uh, in particular, which has the most anti-inflammatory benefits that shows the most benefits. And that the more EPA that people consume, the lower their anxiety. So just to clarify, for those who are not familiar, like what is EPA and like omega-3s? So there's different types of omega-3s. So if omega-3s is kind of like the umbrella, the top of it, you have short chain omega-3s. This is ALA. This is typically found in your plants. Uh, foods such as chia seeds, flax seeds, hemp seeds, and pumpkin seeds. Then you have your EPA, which are long chain omega-3s. And then you have your DHA, which is also a long chain omega-3. EPA and DHA is often found in cold water oily fish, such as salmon, mackerel, herring, sardines, um, you name it, anchovies. But it is also found in algae. And algae uh, gets bioaccumulated in the tissue of these fish and um, is particularly rich in DHA, not EPA. So really looking at the inclusion of more cold water oily fish, potentially the use of a supplement, um, but also considering the ratio of omega-6s to omega-3s, which can also drive inflammation. I know you talk about on your page. Yeah. I'm glad you touched upon omega-3s because I think they're so important and they're also important in hormonal health and um, hormonal, I think Hormones being off balance can contribute to anxiety as well, I'm assuming. Okay, we're going to get to that okay. in just a minute. Um, but omega-3s are great for hormones, and so I'm glad you touched upon that. And I do talk about omega-6s and that omega-3 ratio being off a lot because our processed foods are full of way too many omega-6s. And so if people are out there listening, like, how do I reduce this inflammation? Do what he said, eat more whole foods, the more plants, the fruits, the vegetables, incorporate the omega-3s and reduce that processed food because you will reduce a lot of those omega-6s. Perfectly said. And I think, and that's what I, I love about your page in particular is you make it so accessible for people and meeting them where they're at, as opposed to saying you can only eat whole foods and that there are better options too. Like maybe you're working towards a more whole foods diet that incorporates all the color and diversity and antioxidants. But in the meantime, what are better alternatives that I can choose that aren't going to compromise my health? Right. Oh, well, I love that. Okay. So let's talk about, let's talk about hormones since I just brought that up. Yeah. Does hormonal imbalance play a part in anxiety? I know it does in depression because I struggled with depression for years and that was one root cause. I had many root causes, but does it also play a role in anxiety? It sure does. Um, so for those that are not familiar with what hormones are, they are basically chemical messengers that travel throughout the blood. They go to a target organ and they serve a certain specific function. And, um, you know, there are various, what I would call organic root causes of anxiety. So if you go and see a doctor, uh, just your general PCP or your GP, and you come in and you say, hey, I've been anxious and I've been anxious for months and it's really affecting my quality of life. They may do some blood work to just see like, is there actually a, 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 
a cause that we can actually treat that is contributing to the anxiety. And when we treat that, then the anxiety will lift or disappear, right? So some of those can be a thyroid dysfunction, mainly um, hyperthyroidism, where your thyroid is overactive. So your thyroid um, is, a, it is a hormone um, and it regulates metabolism amongst other things as well. As well. Blood sugar, so insulin is a hormone as well. And insulin is a hormone that is secreted in response to rising blood sugar. So if you eat anything, typically your blood sugars rise. Insulin takes the blood sugar, takes from the bloodstream and it brings it into the cell. Insulin is that key, opens the locks of the cell, gets it into the cell. It does no good to have just elevated blood, blood glucose levels. You actually have to get it into the cell. So insulin plays a role there. Menopause. So, uh, you know, menopause and postmenopausal women um, in that transition, when estrogen starts to decline as well, may feel more, will feel typically more anxious as well as, as well as more depressed. Uh, they also may have insomnia, they may feel more irritable. Um, and so it has a direct impact on their mood. Um, it also has to do with progesterone as well. So there's kind of like looking at progesterone as well as um, estrogen and you know, as women go into menopause and uh, ultimately um, they go postmenopausal, you're looking at that balance of estrogen to progesterone and how that declines after um, your menopausal years um, or premenopausal years. Um, and, and then there's other uh, metabolic abnormalities as well that can contribute to that as well. So if someone's dealing with anxiety, they should go get their hormones checked as one of the checkoff, you know, like a box yeah. to check off of all these different things that could be contributing to it. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, you could do like standard blood work, like looking at somebody's thyroid function. You can look at their blood glucose or hemoglobin A1C to see if there's blood sugar irregularities. You can look at a fasting insulin to look at that. Um, you can also do a hormone panel looking at somebody's um, uh, estrogen levels. Um, and I know that, um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the dried urine. Um, the Dutch test. test. Like a Dutch test. Yep, yeah. That's a great um, one which I'm a big fan of, and it can give a lot of great insight too into hormones, but um, sometimes it will be, um, so there's the dried urine, there's saliva, there's serum, but it can just paint a picture too and, and give a little window in, could the hormones be um, a contributing factor? Are hormones always the root cause? I would disagree because there's so many other factors that are influencing your hormones and that's the gut microbiome, it's your metabolic health, it's environmental factors, it's the health of your mitochondria. So there's so many more things to, to it, um, but it could be one of those pieces to the puzzle. Okay. I love that you said that because there are a ton of pieces to the puzzle. Like there's not just one root cause. And I try to teach that over and over. And so if you go to one doctor and they say like, oh, everything's fine. Your hormones are fine. And the person's like, but I still feel it's so crappy. Well, there's yeah. other pieces to the puzzle. So there are yeah. always multiple root causes usually for an illness, but you just touched upon environmental factors. So let's talk about that. Do they play a role in anxiety as well? Short answer, yes. And the, the, I mean, I'll say the big pillars and how they do impact anxiety or influence mental health in general is that um, environmental factors can and contribute to inflammation. So again, that role of neuroinflammation. They can also alter epigenetic expression. So what I mean by that is your genes basically are like dimming light switches. They can be turned on, they can be turned off, they can be turned up, and they can be turned down. And they are sensitive to um, all these different environmental factors, and that's going to influence epigenetic expression. And if you are somebody that maybe has a genetic susceptibility to a mental illness because it runs in your family, those environmental insults and those chemicals can influence and drive the, um, the kind of switch and, and modulation of your genes that could make you more predisposed and or turn it on to where it manifests to some type of diagnosable disease. The other thing too, is that when you think about herbicides and pesticides, how those modulate and affect the gut microbiome. And we talked about too, how um, the gut microbiome in particular, you know, plays a very intimate role in the gut brain connection and the production of neurotransmitters and how it can infect our mood. So, you know, those are the kind of three big pillars. It's direct inflammation. I also think about um, how it can impact our mitochondria and mitochondrial health. Um, and then thinking about the gut microbiome and then thinking about epigenetic expression in our genes. Okay. So when we say environmental factors, cause I know listeners will be like, what are we talking about? What are we talking about with environmental factors? Yeah, it can be a lot of different things. So it can be stuff like heavy metals. It can be plasticizers such as PCPs and parabens and, and, uh, phthalates and, uh, BPA and BPS, um, which basically, act as xenoestrogens, so they mimic the actions of estrogen in the body. Um, 
And what else could it be? It can be um, chem different chemicals and toxicants. It can be stuff like herbicides and pesticides. Um, I would even include various environmental factors such as mold and mycotoxins um, and things that we're exposed to in that nature. Um, and so, and even, you know, chemical fragrances, um, things that are in your personal care products and everyday, um, you know, bathing and cleanly supplies um, and, you know, all these different man-made chemicals. Um, they basically have this additive effect on the body and can kind of contribute to what I like to call the allostatic load or this total toxic burden on the body, if you think of it like a rain barrel. And so you're kind of thinking, how does that contribute to that? And the more that that rain barrel kind of gets filled up, it's kind of, in a way, muddying the waters and is again, gonna kind of, you know, change and alter the activation and inactivation of those genes. Okay, I love that analogy of the rain bucket because it's like the bucket can hold some water, but once it becomes overflowing, that's when some issues occur. And so it's sort of the same analogy with the body. Like we can't avoid all toxins. We breathe them, we absorb them, we digest them. Our liver can detox them or, you know, it can do its part, but when that bucket gets too full and it's overflowing, that's when problems occur. So I do love that analogy. Okay. Yeah. So you were saying environmental toxins um, can affect like the gut and the epigenics and the mitochondria and inflammation. So let's talk about, we've talked about all of those a little bit, except the mitochondria. So tell me how the mitochondria plays a part. Yeah. So most people may recall that in um, maybe middle school that they learned about the mitochondria and they even learned about elementary school, the powerhouse of the cell and your mitochondria. Um, there's multiple, you know, they're very dense within the cell and each cell has multiple mitochondria. Those mitochondria actually create ATP. Um, and that is cellular energy. That's kind of the cellular currency and your brain in particular is the most densely populated region of mitochondria. Your heart is also a really densely uh, populated region of mitochondria. And when we're talking about kind of mental health and bringing it back into like anxiety and mood, mitochondria play a key role in regulating, um, brain function, cognition, but even regulating how nerves are communicating with each other. And so when the mitochondria get bogged down and they become dysfunctional, they can be a root cause to a lot of different things. And so we know mitochondrial dysfunction, so dysfunctioning of the mitochondria, damage to the mitochondria uh, is connected to a whole host of different chronic diseases. And anxiety and depression are just two examples of that too. Uh, bipolar disorder can also be a, a part of that as well, as well as schizophrenia. But beyond that too, you have stuff like Alzheimer's disease, you have cardiometabolic issues like diabetes, um, you know, you name it. So there's a whole host of issues when it comes to mitochondria. And you got to think about what are all the things that can be interfering and or damaging the mitochondria. Environmental toxicants definitely can contribute to that, especially heavy metals in our, that are pervasive in our environment. And they can also be found in our food. Um, certain medications and antibiotics can also, um, you know, disrupt the mitochondria as well. So somebody that's been on, you know, several rounds of medications, especially systemically absorbed antibiotics can also disrupt the mitochondria. Uh, stress plays a role in all of this as well. So there's all these different factors, but your mitochondria are very, very important or something that we need to uh, kind of, you know, safeguard in a way. And, you know, there's various different things that we can do on a daily basis to support those mitochondria, uh, to nourish them and making sure that they're functioning optimally. And what are those things that people can do? Because I know they're listening saying, well, okay, so shoot, my, mine might be a mess. What, what do I do to help them? Right. Yeah. So some of my favorite things, um, hot, cold contrast therapy. So, um, heat thermal stress, uh, as well as cold stress. Um, so when the body gets out of that comfortable 70 degrees that we kind of are always living in, um, this can be a form of stress on the body. So I call it hormetic stress. And this is basically the idea that, um, a small stressor on the body makes the, the human and the organism more adaptable to that stress. Um, and it's, and hormesis is kind of this bell shaped curve and you get benefit in the middle, but if too much, it can be deleterious too little, you don't get any benefit. So sauna can be a way of kind of that thermal induced stress that can be great for mitochondrial health, um, cold immersion therapy. And that is more, um, longer, uh, two to five minute kind of exposure to cold can also be, uh, something that can be beneficial to the mitochondria because it influences the production of cold shock proteins. And in the presence of heat, it produces heat shock proteins. Um, caloric restricted diets and fasting can also help to improve mitochondrial health. So um, time and time again, we see the benefits of a caloric restricted diet. Um, and, um, you know, that also helps with longevity and anti-aging. 
um, various micronutrients that you're going to find in not only plant-based foods, but in animal foods, especially organ meats. So offal, things like liver and kidney and spleen and the thymus um, and heart. Those are all going to be really rich in nutrients that are going to help support the mitochondria. And then the other thing too, I would say um, is red light therapy. Um, so this is because the mitochondria contain uh, various, uh, they're called chromophores, but they're basically receptive to light in various wavelengths of light, and it can help improve mitochondrial function. So these can all help improve mitochondria. But I would say the also thing too, is not only do you have to give the body what it needs in terms of to support the mitochondria, but you also have to remove the offending factors. So all the things that we talked about earlier, if you have a huge heavy metal burden on the body and you're lead toxic or you're cadmium toxic, you know, that is going to um, be a burden on the mitochondria. And you could take all the supplements, eat all the best foods and, you know, use red light therapy. But until you remove those offending factors, the body's going to chronically kind of be in this reactive state. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, that does. Yeah. I love that you say you have to remove it. Yeah. So you have to kind of think about the two. It's kind of removing the offending factors and then giving the body what it needs. And you put your body in a position to heal. I love that. Well, and with mitochondria, a, a plant diet, I mean, with good fiber, good things. I mean, whole foods are going to help those mitochondria as well, giving them the yes. micronutrients that they need. And when yeah. you, when you say organs, I, I get this all the time from people. So I'm going to say it on this podcast. If you can't handle cooking with um, liver or things like that, they actually... Or you can buy them in supplement form, a dried form. So for all those thinking they now have to go cook with it. It'd be awesome if they could, though. Yeah, I mean, I, I use desiccated liver capsules this time. It can be a really great uh, source. Um, sardines are also considered a, I consider them an organ, um, as organ meat, uh, if you eat them with the bone in, because it's the whole, whole fish. Okay, so if I've got listeners that are dealing with anxiety, you've talked about diet, we've talked about the gut and inflammation, we've talked about the environmental toxins, we've talked about mitochondria. Let's quickly touch upon two other things. Exercise. Does exercise help anxiety? It absolutely does. And so when we're talking about what are the treatment options for anxiety, you may be offered by your PCP different pharmaceutical options. But um, with that too, typically um, is exercise and mindfulness-based stress reduction techniques. And those can be used for everyone. And so exercise is the most underused antidepressant, but it can also be a great anxiolytic as well. And the reason why is it is going to reduce inflammation in the body uh, long-term acutely. It can actually increase inflammation. Inflammation isn't necessarily bad. It's kind right. of a double-edged sword. You don't want too much. You don't want the chronicity of it, uh, but you don't want too little as well. Right. Acute inflammation actually has an adaptive beneficial component to it. So um, exercise, I think the biggest component to it though, is it, it, we were talking about epigenetics. So how environmental factors can change the expression of our genes, the way that exercise modulates our gene expression, I think is the biggest benefit of exercise when it comes to a lot of these mental health um, conditions. And so exercise can absolutely improve that as well as improving our cardiometabolic function too. So if you're talking about blood sugar imbalances and diabetes, or you have high blood pressure, um, or, you know, and those pieces contributing to anxiety, if it's an organic cause, exercise can help with all of that. Okay. And let's talk about this. I know you've talked about multiple times on the show, but just to clarify for people, because I get asked this a lot, people will tell me, oh, I have depression because it's genetic in my family. And so I love that you're saying, well, we can turn it up and down. It's like a dimmer switch. But whether that depression or anxiety here in this case manifests itself can be a lot based on how we, our lifestyle, what we eat and what we, if we exercise and what products we're using, things like that, right? Absolutely. I'd say the big four pillars are diet, stress reduction, sleep and toxicant exposures and environmental exposures. Those are the four big pillars that we can control and have a direct influence on our genetics. Thank you for touching upon that because I think we're just coming out of this. Well, this, I think our generation maybe, or this society now is finally getting out of that locked mindset of, well, it's genetic, so I have it. So I'm doomed with it. So thank you for touching upon that because we can do something about it. Of course. 
Let's talk supplements really quick. For a lot of people struggling, sometimes maybe a supplement's like the first step to help them get on this path. They feel like, oh, a supplement might help and I'll work on my diet, things like that. So what supplements would you suggest for anxiety? Yeah, um, I will speak to the ones that have uh, have some clinical benefit and have been shown in the literature to have either an association or some benefit. But I will say that, um, and you even spoke to this a little bit too, you can't supplement your way out of a bad diet or all these bad habits. Um, so really looking at the whole person and really implementing these whole things, which let's, I'm going to be honest, it takes a lot of work. And I think that's why a lot of people get discouraged and, or maybe never embark on the lifestyle things because it really takes a lot of time and a commitment to your health. Um, and for some people, um, maybe they don't have the resources to buy supplements and, you know, having a pharmaceutical medication that is covered by insurance is their best option. And there's no shame in that, right. but realizing that there are other options out there is what I want people to be aware about and to make, make people feel empowered that, you know, that their lifestyle choices do, um, you know, add up in terms of how it can impact someone's mental health, especially as it relates to anxiety. So when it comes to supplements, we do know that there is an association in people that are anxious and being deficient in several vitamins. Uh, those are vitamin D, magnesium, and vitamin B1. Uh, vitamin B6 also uh, can be another one. Um, so B vitamins, magnesium, and vitamin D. So vitamin D, um, you know, somebody may like, you know, be quick to, to supplement with, but you know, where do we get vitamin D just to kind of talk about whole foods and where do we typically get these things? Vitamin D, uh, we get from the sun. So the UV rays from the sun, when there's enough, you know, UV rays, um, it's going to penetrate the skin and it's going to, you know, raise our blood circulating vitamin D. Um, in the winter months, most people will supplement, supplement to increase those level. And if people live in the Pacific Northwest or uh, the Northeast where, you know, there's colder climates and they don't get so much sun, some people experience seasonal affective disorder. And so there's this intimate role with, you know, light and vitamin D and inflammation and how it can affect mood. So vitamin D is one. Magnesium is another big one. It's probably my favorite mineral and it's involved in over 300 different enzymatic reactions in the body. It is so, so, so important. And uh, we do know that people with anxiety um, there's an association with people with an anxiety and having lower levels of magnesium. And so magnesium, um, you know, I would say upwards of 60% or two thirds of the U S population have a subclinical magnesium deficiency. And why is that? I mean, one reason people may not be eating magnesium rich foods. Uh, those foods can be stuff like avocado, black beans, dark leafy greens, chocolate, um, and, you know, sweet potato, um, but the other thing too, is you have to think about all the different factors that can be depleting magnesium as well. So when we live really stressed life lifestyles, we're going to churn through more magnesium. Um, if you have gut-based issues and you're not even able to absorb those nutrients, then you may need more magnesium as well. Our soil, our topsoil is so depleted nowadays because of our conventional agricultural practices that, you know, the magnesium isn't in the soil and therefore it's not in our food. And so, you know, if it's not in the soil, it's not in our food. And then we're not getting that as well. It's also been removed largely from our municipal water supply. So thinking about the water and how we get magnesium. Um, so there's all these different factors that, you know, are reducing magnesium in addition to certain medications that can also deplete magnesium. So magnesium supplement, supplementation can be really beneficial and it really kind of provides this calmness. It's kind of the, um, it's more calming and relaxing. It helps to engender more of this parasympathetic relax and rest kind of mode. So um, magnesium can be very beneficial for some. And, um, you know, for some people it could, you know, they take magnesium and they notice that their anxiety is so much better for other people. It doesn't do much. And then thiamine, which is vitamin B1 is another one that, um, you know, there's an association of people with anxiety that have lower amounts of vitamin B1. Also, when we drink alcohol and abuse alcohol, which we do often in this country, um, it not only depletes magnesium, it also de depletes vitamin B1. So thinking about binge drinking and thinking about what type of practices we're partaking in. Um, and some people may know that when they drink alcohol, they're more anxious the next day. They also don't sleep as well. Um, and we also know that when we don't get a good night's sleep, that our amygdala is more reactive the next day. So kind of tying this all back to you know what we were talking about earlier in this podcast is that when we talk about anxiety, we're topic, typically talking about a hyperactive, hyper-responsive amygdala, and that's leading to more of this fear-based um, picture. So those are the three big minerals. And then 
um, and vitamins. And then turmeric is probably one of my favorite spices. And, you know, talking about the inflammatory component and neuroinflammation, how to reduce inflammation, turmeric has been shown to be a very uh, beneficial spice. I think of it as kitchen medicine. It's something you can incorporate in everyday cooking. Yes, people can supplement with it. Um, but it increases BDNF, which we talked about earlier, that miracle growth for the brain. It can slow cognitive decline. It increases the growth of new neurons, and it can also prevent or blunt the damaging effects of high cortisol, which can damage the neurons in the brain. So I really, really like turmeric, uh, curcumin being the active constituent in that, um, but you can add turmeric to scrambled eggs. You can make uh, turmeric lattes with coconut milk. Um, you can make uh, turmeric oatmeal or bliss balls or so many different things you can do with it in the kitchen. I'm so glad you brought up turmeric because it, it's, it's one of my favorites, along with magnesium. Those are two that I am constantly telling people about. Oh, and we forgot omega-3s. You can supplement with that omega as well. Omega-3s, yes. And so I will say, little caveat, um, and you talked about I always talk about this with the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, and I know you've talked about it, just, just so people are aware of this though, is that omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids both compete for the same desaturase enzyme. And what I mean by that is that in the context of excessive omega-6s in the diet, which most people consume about 20 to one in terms of a ratio of omega-6 to omega-3, with excess omega-6s, it blocks the absorption of those anti-inflammatory omega-3s. And I like to kind of paint this picture of a game of musical chairs. If your body's super saturated in omega-6s, then all those chairs are occupied by omega-6s. What happens then is omega-3 can't come in and join the party since they both compete for the same enzyme. And so what happens is like if people are trying to throw in omega-3, but they're not simultaneously reducing the omega-6s in their diet, I don't believe they're going to get the full benefits that they would get if they're simultaneously reducing omega-6s and increasing the omega-3s in their diet. That is a perfect analogy. That is great. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Okay, you've touched upon a few alternative therapies because some people are to the point that they're like, okay, we've cleaned up the diet, we've cleaned up um, you know, fact or environmental factors that we're using at home, we're exercising, things like that. People are looking for more when they're just not feeling exactly right yet. So You've touched upon a few alternative therapies like red light, sauna. Um, what else would you suggest? Oh, the cold heat you talked about. What else would you suggest? Yeah, um, I think I'm, I'm a big proponent, proponent of the exercise we talked about, mindfulness-based stress reduction techniques. Uh, so these are things like meditation and breath work and where we're really connecting to our breath, where our breath is our direct line to our autonomic nervous system. And under your autonomic nervous system is your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And that sympathetic nervous system is that fight or flight. We run into a bear, we feel aroused. It's like, we're either going to run or fight that bear. That breath work and kind of meditation can be used to augment and reduce that stress response that could also, you know, trigger those that are susceptible to anxiety to more of that fear and panic. So I'm a big proponent of breath work and anything that is gonna help to ramp down that fight or flight response. Um, I'm also a big fan of herbs. And so um, in naturopathic medicine, I love that we have this, you know, really large um, toolkit to pull from to help patients, whether that is pharmaceuticals or nutrition or homeopathy, but also botanical medicine. So um, I'm a big fan of lavender and there's good clinical evidence to suggest the benefits of uh, lavender essential oil. Um, as an extract, um, Integrative Therapeutics creates a brand called Lavella um, that is, um, has evidence to suggest its benefits for those with generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, it has a very calming property to it. Um, but there's another class of herbs that I'm a big fan of called Nervines. And Nervines act on the central nervous system and help to kind of calm um, the body and they, um, kind of weakly interact with GABA receptors. So GABA is the calming neurotransmitter in our body and it helps us feel calm, relax, and helps us to focus. Some people may directly supplement with GABA because GABA is our uh, main inhibitory neurotransmitter, uh, but it's not poorly, uh, it's poorly absorbed and it's not as bioavailable. So I will do a liposomal form where it's the GABA is bound to, um, to fat basically, and it makes it better absorbed. Um, I also really like L-theanine, which, uh, can be found in green tea. And it also has, uh, calming properties to it as well. Um, there's a product by designs for health that is a liposomal GABA and, uh, L-theanine brand that, um, I've seen work really well. I have no affiliation with any of these companies that I'm mentioning as well, but, 
um, you know, that's something you can talk to your doctor about if that's something that interests you. But these nervine herbs um, are things like passiflora, valerian, lemon balm, chamomile, and skull cap. Pe people may have heard of chamomile tea, um, and it can kind of help to, you know, take it in the evening, unwind, calm you down, also has some gut benefits. It also has antispasmodic properties if you kind of have um, an upset tummy and, and kind of cramps. Um, but all these kind of help uh, to calm the central nervous system. It has a slight sedating effect, uh, but it's all working on these GABA receptors. They're kind of considered GABA agonists, meaning that they're binding to those GABA sites and they're helping to increase the amount of GABA in the body to kind of calm the body. Now, I will say that a lot of these herbs have not been studied in pregnancy. Um, so they're often contraindicated in pregnancy. So it's always best to check with your doctor if there are any contraca contraindications. And for some people too, um, they're not right for people that are on blood thinning medications. So, um, you know, I love herbs. They can be a great, um, you know, adjunctive, you know, utility tool. Uh, and some people can find great benefit with it as well and maybe even manage their anxiety with herbs. But again, every person's gonna be a little bit different. And I will say that those uh, herbs aren't treating the underlying root cause as well. Okay, good to know. Thank you for sharing all of that. I hope um, that my listeners just are like, oh, wow, I feel empowered now to make some other choices or know that there's other choices out there. They can work on diet. They can work on products they're using. They can work on breathing and, you know, meditation. They can work on these alternative therapies. They can use herbs. I hope they've just realized there's a bunch of options out there that they can look into. Absolutely. Um, so if someone is on anxiety medicine and they're now hearing this, like, oh, okay, maybe I could wean myself off of my medication that I'm on. Um, what's your advice for them? Because I know when I weaned myself off depression medicine, let me just say there's nothing wrong with the medicine. I was on antidepressants, but for me, like you, it just numbed my emotions. I didn't feel that great on it. I wanted to wean off because I wanted to heal from that. I wanted to know what the root causes are. So um, I'm not shaming anyone by asking this question. I'm just, I know that there's people out there that are like, oh yeah, I want to heal or I want to wean off my medicine. So what is your advice for them? Yeah, that's a really great question. And, you know, I think this is something that does require, you know, having your physician and whoever is prescribing those medications being on your team and someone that is going to advocate for you and listen to your goals. Um, I think that's so important to have a physician in your corner that is going to, you know, champion you and help you through this process. But regardless of what medication someone is on, because depending on what medication they are on for anxiety is going to determine what that taper may look like or weaning off of. Um, and so exercise is always something that can be used to augment any type of medication someone's on, whether that's an SSRI, an SNRI, or, you know, some people use benzos because they work real fast, um, but they're typically used for short-term uh, relief of anxiety or panic. Uh, but the exercise can always be used, again, the breath work and the mindfulness-based stress redu reduction technique. Um, so anything that, you know, you're open to, that can be yoga, it can be, again, meditation or breath work, all those things can be used when you're still on medications. And you can also change your diet. You can start to adopt a more whole foods diet. Um, so it's worth trying some of these options while you're on it to see, do I feel even better? And then starting to have that conversation because I do understand for people, you know, once you get stable on a medication, you don't want to go to go back and start feeling, mm -hmm. um, anxious, or if you're on an antidepressant, feeling depressed. And again, it, there's that overlap too. So, um, I know there's, there can be a lot of fear as well. And so again, having that doctor in the corner to monitor things, but, you know, implementing the exercise, implementing the, the yoga, the mindfulness practices and the breath work, incorporating more wholesome nutrient dense foods, adding spices and color to your diet as much as possible. And thinking about prebiotics and probiotics. I think those can all be used while on medications. They absolutely can as you're kind of coming up with a game plan of how we're going to taper off. And for a lot of these medications too, and again, depending on what type of medication, because there's a bunch of different um, kind of right. categories of medications people can be on, um, you know, to general, to, to taper off over, you know, a week or two uh, and kind of come up with the best solution that's for you. And that's the whole thing is it needs to be individualized. It really does. And that's the hard part where I love providing education and empowerment. And I hope that this leaves people 
um, feeling empowered and hopeful that like there's something else I can try other than just medications. And they can use these as tools as they're kind of working towards that goal of maybe getting off a of medication if that is their ultimate goal. Right. Thank you so much for sharing that because it you should work with a doctor, one that's going to champion you, like you said, but I'll just let you know, it took me almost two years to wean off my medicine because I did a whole year first of incorporating better foods into my diet and exercising and doing all of those things before I even started because I wasn't doing those previously. So did that. And then it was almost a year of weaning off because I wanted to go so slow just so I, there was no effects, you know, so yeah, that's my so advice to people. Is, yep. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Carolyn. And, um, you know, I think that's a, just a, gr a great place for people to start if they are open-minded to that. Thank you so much, Tyler, for being here and sharing all of this. I know people have learned stuff. I know they feel more empowered to make some choices of what they want to do and just are being educated on anxiety and that's something they can um, better if they want so thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. Um, I close every podcast with asking what the guest thinks is the best ingredient in life. What would you say is the best ingredient in life? That is a really great question. I would say, coming from my own personal experience, that the best ingredient for life is living a life of authenticity and speaking your truth and standing in who you are 100%. Oh, I love that. Every guest has brought something different. And I love that. Be who you are. There's nothing wrong with who you are. And we are all going to be different. And you life is me. going to make us different. And we are going to be different physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, like everything out there, we're all going to be different. So I love that. Be you and there's no shame in you. You should be proud of who you are and grateful for who you are. Yes, we need you. So I love that. Thank you so much. Tell my listeners where they can find you because I know they will want to hear more from you. Yes. Yeah, so I spend a lot of my time on Instagram at functional.foods. Um, I also have a lot of resources on my website at tylergene.com. And uh, they'll find a bunch of different resources there. But um, I also have Facebook uh, at Functional Foods. Um, but again, most people are going to find me on Instagram. So I spend most of my time. Okay. Thank you so much. Again, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you are so busy with trying to finish up medical school. So um, congrats to you on that. And best of luck to you for these last couple months of that. And again, thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Carolina. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for listening. Remember to subscribe to the Just Ingredients podcast to learn more about your health and good ingredients to life. Plus, get daily tips at just.ingredients on Instagram.